Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems. As usually, my biased collection, my extremely biased point of view. Um, strictly speaking, today I won't even show you any theorems. Well, I show you quite a few theorems, but none of them is uh, well the main topic of this uh, video. But I would rather show you a certain philosophy in mathematics. Or actually, strictly speaking, a subfield of mathematics which I think uh, deserves much more well, attention that it actually gets. It's called reverse mathematics. Um, or you can also think of it as like being doing everything backwards. Uh, we'll see what that actually means. Um, so this is really a subfield of mathematics. Um, some people would say it's a subfield of logic. So if you want to make the distinction between logic and mathematics, then it would be more or, le more or less a subfield of logic. And it's pretty nice in the sense that it wants to compare certain theorems. We'll see what that means. So you have your theorem A and you like it a lot, and you have your theorem B and you like it a lot, and you would like to figure out how they are they related. In the easiest case, you can just prove one from the other. That might be very tricky in practice in some sense. So what reverse mathematics is trying to aim at, uh, very easily formulated, would be to take theorem A, to break it into pieces until you're at the axiomatic level, so you break it into its fundamental axioms, you do the same with B and then you compare the basic pieces and then you would see that those two theorems are uh, kind of equivalent in a certain way. Uh, so another point of thinking about reverse mathematics is, is really just kind of um, what are the right axioms for a theorem in the sense that the right axioms for a theorem are those that the theorem is actually equivalent to the axioms. So usually you would like to try to prove theorems from axioms and reverse mathematics is doing it in the other way, right? You take a well-known theorem, you break it into its most basic pieces, and you see what you get, right? So that's actually a pretty nice idea. And I find it very shocking that it took so long to really fly. Uh, so it's fairly new, so maybe 70s of the last century. Everything I'm saying is linked in the description. In particular, there's also a nice book, which uh, this video is based on, it's called reverse mathematics. It's linked in the description. Anyway, so let me try to get started to get us all uh, on the same page. Let me start with something extremely classical. Maybe if I really, I, the list of my favorite theorems should at one point include Pythagorean theorem. That's what you see right now. Uh, I mean, of course, right? I mean, we all know that, sure. Uh, but it's, it's super easy in some sense. And of course, it's super practical. It's really one of the cornerstones of human history, if you want. And here's a visual proof of it, uh, the most classical one. And the, the thing I would like to think you about it, well, just stay at those pictures. The pictures prove it. The, the, the formula, of course, the well-known formula, um, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I won't explain the picture. The picture is self-explanatory anyway. Um, it doesn't also doesn't matter so much. Point is, and this Pythagorean theorem, of course, is super old, uh, was known long before Pythagoras' time. So um, this very classical theorem has zillions of proofs. Uh, well, in 2021, it has zillions of proofs. And certainly there will be new proofs discovered in the future. And this is the most classical one. Okay, very interesting, very nice. You can collect proofs. Some people do that, some people collect proofs. This is the most, probably the most po popular one. You can also collect proofs of something like fundamental theorem of algebra, also has quite a few proofs. Anyway, so the, the real question I would like to address here is kind of what makes this a proof? So what are the ingredients of the proof? What are the inputs of this proof? Let's say of this proof. So what, what do I really need to know to prove Pythagoras' theorem, right? What I really need to know to prove a squared equals b, uh, plus b squared equals c squared. So what do I really need to know? In other words, um, you show me one of these other zillions of proofs, uh, they have different ways of argumentation. That's why they are different proofs, right? And you wonder um, what are the kind of the similarities? So what is this all based on? What are the axioms? that I really need to know to prove this theorem. And that's, if you believe that this is a good strategy, then you all kind of already have invented reverse mathematics because that's kind of the main question here. So I'm not really interested in the theorem. I'm not really interested in the proof of the theorem, but I'm more interested in the whole greater picture. Where does the proof of 
where does any proof of this theorem in the end fits into? And a lot of people tried that before invention of reverse mathematics, in particular in the following setup, which is kind of the classical example um, from Euclid's axioms. So again, Euclid 2000-ish years ago, uh, God knows whether Euclid actually was a real person or more like a, a collection of authors. There's a discussion among historians. I don't know, but uh, it also doesn't really matter for this video. Let's just say there was something called Euclid and this something has made something like uh, six axioms. Strictly speaking, this something has only made five axioms, kind of missed the rest. Uh, but anyway, I, I don't want to point fingers. I mean, it was, this was 2000 years ago, right? This was still a breakthrough, in, not just in mathematics, in, in general. This is, this is, Euclid is amazing, so Euclid theorems. And um, yeah, so there are five of them. And the first four, they sound relatively harmless. They're kind of of the form like, well, between two points, there's a line. So here are two points, here's a line. This was a really bad line. You will forgive me. Um, <laughs> so let me, let me just do it again. So between those two points, there is a line. Okay, very good. And you can extend finite lines to infinite lines. So this was already an infinite line kind of that I draw here. Of course, I can't draw infinite lines, it's still a finite piece. Anyway, um, there's an axiom that's saying you can draw circles around lines. So you can draw a circle if you already know this line here. Um, you can draw a circle of this uh, with this diameter and something, some, some compare some axioms, like all right angles are congruent and so on. So really harmless sounding. And then you have number five, um, which I formulate like this. So this is not the original formulation. Some uh, equivalent formulations are, can be found below. But basically what you're saying is that this always holds, um, namely that um, a, a triangle, the uh, angles always add up to 180%. And yeah, in this example, I can actually do the arithmetic in my hand, head. So 60 plus 60 plus 60 sounds like 180, very good. But the point is this axiom assumes that this is always true. Kind of a fun fact that this actually is an axiom of Euclidean geometry because it's equivalent to the, the standard one, the parallel axiom, which I don't want to formulate here. Parallel postulate, whatever, whatever it's called. I don't want to formulate it here. So these were the five axioms of Euclid. Uh, as I said, up to the fact that I exchanged the fifth one for a more suitable one for this, um, for this video. And there is the sixth one, this implicit that Euclid never states. As I said, it was 2,300-ish years ago. So no one to blame here. Uh, but basically, there's also the, the implicit rules of common sense. So about what, allowed, what operations are allowed and what is equal and so on, some rules of common sense. Let me just keep that completely implicit. Anyway, so you have those five, five axioms. And it's not hard to see that um, our good old friend Pythagoras actually follows from uh, those five, five or six axioms, depends how you want to count. The more surprising thing is that actually it's equivalent in the following way. Oops, our, our good old a squared plus b squared plus c equals c squared is actually equivalent to number five. So number five was exactly this one. All angles in a triangle are 180 degrees. It already sounds strange compared to the other four, right? I can draw a circle. That's, a, that's an axiom. Yeah, sure. If I, if I wouldn't be allowed to draw a circle, then probably my whole Euclidean geometry would be pretty boring. Uh, but number five sounds a bit weird. Obviously, that's what we have learned. So we kind of believe that. But it, it's really a learning issue. And that's, that's kind of the point. Um, there is no good reason for this to be true. Uh, it's, it's just postulated as an axiom. And it turns out that it's actually wrong in other types of geometry, those non-Euclidean geometries. Beautiful theory. I'm not going too much into it. Um, time for another video, maybe. I also linked a few videos in the description. But basically, the idea is as follows. So I just showed you this one here. Um, so our good old a squared plus b squared equals c squared theorem follows from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and i. OK, sure. A little bit trickier to see is that you can exchange five and our good old uh, a squared plus b squared plus equals c squared theorem. So on the other hand, one, two, three, four, Pythagoras and i imply five. So they're equivalent, you can exchange them, which is already a bit weird, but that's good. 
And what you need to do is a little bit more, you need to kind of make sure that you haven't created a, a stupid kind of geometry in this case. And yeah, that's what Euclid did, right? So Euclid created Euclidean geometry, sure. And it, what, what what really goes on here is to say that this is kind of, it doesn't lead to any kind of stupid contradiction. So one, two, three, four, five, and I create Euclidean geometry. And a fun fact is that, and I'm going to explain that in a second on those pictures, that actually you can also put not five or a reasonable reformulation of, of five into I and you, it still makes sense. So five doesn't need to be true. And the reasonable uh, reformulations here lead to what is called spherical or hyperbolic geometry. So Euclidean geometry, you can call it flat geometry. It's on a flat space. And yep, Pythagoras theorem, as I just explained, holds in flat geometry and actually secretly an axiom of geometry. So Pythagorean theorem is secretly an axiom of geometry, just, just, just to keep that in mind. If you want to quit the video now, this is a good time because that's actually a nice sentence to end it anyway. Um, and you have variants of Pythagorean theorem um, in so-called spherical geometry. That's really just, uh, you do your geometry on the surface of the earth, right? And in hyperbolic geometry, that's like you do geometry on a saddle, on the saddle type object that is illustrated here. So in spherical geometry, if you draw um, a triangle in spherical geometry, it gets fat. So this is called the fat triangle in the sense that now the angles uh, add up to more than 180 degrees. Remember this angles add up to 180 degrees seems to be a bit artificial. And yes, if you do it on a sphere, that's actually not true. You could still draw lines and circles on a sphere. That's not a big problem. Uh, but this theorem is kind of fishy on a sphere. On the other hand, you have those thin triangles uh, on the saddle where, uh, as you can kind of see, there's some kind of, kind of little curvature involved. And actually the angles are less than 180 degrees. And because our theorem, our axiom number five is equivalent to Pythagorean theorem on all of these geometries, we have an equivalent or a different version of Pythagorean theorem um, indicated in below the pictures. So something with cosines, sides, for example. So this really, this really is really cool, right? So um, Pythagorean theorem is actually an axiom of Euclidean geometry, and it doesn't really hold in general. And that's awesome because now we really know where the theorem actually stands in the bigger picture of, of logic and mathematics. And that is kind of the whole essence of reverse mathematics. We already knew that theorem from before, right? Pythagorean theorem, we know that for a long time. We break it down into its most basic pieces. Actually, one of them is equivalent to our theorem, given the others. So we can kind of exchange that and see what, what comes out uh, in some kind of new way. And you, we've just discovered then non-Euclidean geometry which were out there before, of course, but not formulated in, in any axiomatic way. People did the geometry on the sphere a long time before spherical geometry was invented as a field. I'm not sure about the saddle, actually. The saddle is a bit more subtle. But certainly on the sphere, it was long before spherical geometry was really a field of mathematics. Anyway, we just discovered reverse mathematics. And, and as I said, this is shocking to me because the idea is so simple. It's beautiful and simple just reverse everything. Instead of proving theorems, try to decompose theorems already known. And the shocking part here is that, well, as I said, it's super simple. I love it. It's, it's a beautiful idea. And it took to the, well, something like 50 years ago, so 1970s, to really fly to really be a field of mathematics, which is kind of surprising, keeping in mind that the other direction, trying to prove theorems, um, that started basically with Euclid, right? So something like 2,500 years ago. So this is a super new idea compared to Euclid, let's say. Um, and it really is really nice. So reverse mathematics is kind of the reverse of mathematics, if you want. So it's kind of reversing all the ideas. As I said, it's of course part of logic. So you need to be a little bit careful how to formulate things. Um, so I stole this picture from a very nice blog linked in the description, how various theories of logic relate to one another. If you're doing logic, you need to be extremely careful that you know what you write down. So maybe you want to work with Euclid's axioms. Most people nowadays don't want to work with Euclid's axioms anymore. They're kind of outdated a bit because also they are a little bit weakly formulated. You can formulate Euclid's axioms, of course, completely precisely, uh, which was done way later than Euclid anyway. Uh, but most theorem, uh, most theories are more concerned about numbers 
because numbers are in some sense more elementary than, than geometry is. Not quite sure whether I agree with that, but, but certainly numbers are important. So classical examples are PA, for example, uh, which you might have seen in Speriano arithmetic. Um, I'll explain the picture a little bit more in a second. And um, there's also second order arithmetic, which is this outer bubble. So Peano arithmetic is this little inner moon type thing. And the outer bubble is second order arithmetic. And of course, this picture is meant as a Venn diagram, so intersection of various theories. And you can play around with that a little bit. So Q is kind of the, the smallest possible logic system you can have, whatever that means. It's called Robinson arithmetic. It's in some sense very weak. So the bigger the bubble gets, the stronger gets your axiom system. For example, Peano arithmetic is actually too weak to formulate the real numbers because it's part of first order logic. Um, first order logic is in some sense too weak to formulate real numbers because the first order here is referring to that you're allowed to take your quantifiers like uh, for all. You're allowed to take them over sets, but not over sets of sets. And the real numbers are, of course, uh, kind of the sub, the, the, uh, a subset of the subsets of, of n. I hope that was correct. So it's a, they live in the, uh, the power set of the natural numbers. And you kind of want to take quantifiers over sets of sets. That's what you're allowed to do in second order arithmetic. So second order arithmetic is strong enough to formulate the real numbers, for example. And the kind of the classical one you take in second order arithmetic is the one that kind of completes Peano arithmetic to the other side. So here's first order, here's second order. It's called ACA0, whatever that means. Doesn't really matter. It's a certain axiom system, which is strong enough, as I will show you in a second, to formulate most properties you like to see in analysis. So here's another way of thinking about those, those systems of logic. In some sense, first order logic is strong enough to formulate the natural numbers and counting. So um, discrete mathematics, um, combinatorics, algebra up to a certain point. And second order is you need to take, you can now take quantifiers over sets of sets, and then you are strong enough to formulate analysis. Right? So ACA0 is strong enough to formulate all interesting theorems of analysis and then compare them. That's the whole idea. Um, and for the lovers here, um, so you can kind of put various verses. So here's Goodstein, for example. Um, you, could, you could put them into, into various places here uh, for referring in this case um, to kind of the, the corresponding growth functions. If you don't know what that means, it doesn't really matter. It's linked in the description of this nice blog. But for this talk, it certainly doesn't matter. Um, all I want you to know is that there is this bubble thing and you have various versions of arithmetic and various versions of logic that you can apply. And you kind of want to have a measurement how strong certain theorems actually are, right? As I just explained, you want to break them into the basic pieces. So what kind of underlying arithmetic, kind of underlying logic system do you actually need to prove theorem X? And if you're wondering, by the way, where is Sir Melo Frankel's set theory, kind of the most famous and most popular uh, formulation of the foundation of mathematics, it's very far outside. You can't even see it, it's huge. So it's a very huge bubble uh, uh, outside. So Sir Melo Frankel was choice of a very huge outside. So these are much simpler versions of, um, if you want, set theory. And also much weaker versions, like, like um, for some of them, you can't even formulate the real numbers. For some of them, we actually can. And then reverse mathematics uses that and does the following. It's, that's a little bit shocking when I first learned that. So, um, so on, the, on this slide, we have seen those three, and they are kind of nested in one another. And they are, if you want, they are second order arithmetic versions of Peano arithmetic um, in a certain way. And then we would like to do something as follows. So some classical theorems, like the intermediate value theorem, you kind of want to list where they appear. Turns out that the weakest one is strong enough to prove the uh, intermediate value theorem. The second weakest one is strong enough to prove something like kind of, kind of Borel, if you want. And the last one, the, the one that is usually, that I, that I said is strong enough to prove all interesting theorems of, um, of um, analysis is, for example, it, it, it can prove something like a, a Cauchy convergence criterion, which is certainly an interesting theorem of analysis. And how should you read that? Well, it turns out that you have the value theorem, 
And you have this list of theorems, all of which are equivalent. I will come back to two of them in a second. Um, and then on the next page, on the next higher, bigger set of axioms, you pick up new axioms, all of them are equivalent, and so on. So um, some, something there is really surprising, and it really comes from now looking precisely how, to, how things are built up. And I think this is pretty beautiful. For example, Brouwer's fixed point theorem and the Jordan curve theorem are equivalent. Uh, under the assumptions that you work in at least this theory. So um, just before I go to those two, so here's Brower and here's Jordan, let me just say that uh, you can prove those equivalences already in the weakest one, but you just can't prove the theorems themselves in the weakest one. That's again a different statement, whether you can prove that something is equivalent to something different or whether you can really prove that, that it holds. That's, that's kind of different. Just, just keep that in mind. Anyway, so two of my favorite theorems uh, one of them I actually made a video, the other one I probably should do at one point, um, the Brouwer fixed point theorem, which is the following. Just it's really it's just the following. If you want to have a closer look, of course, I link everything in the description. But it basically means the following: take a map, crumble it, put it on place on top of itself or where it was. Or let's say take two maps, put one of them on the floor, crumble the other, put it on top of, of the other one, and there will still be a point which uh is fixed under this crumbling operation, no matter what you do. It's a fixed point theorem. It's, it's a very surprising theorem. In this picture, it seems like Oklahoma is fixed. Um, so anyway, <laughs> so some point is fixed under this crumbling procedure, which is very surprising. I think this is a very surprising theorem. It also is the following, so you can think of it as follows. Um, whenever you have a map in your hand and you're really now in the area where you, where you, where you are, where, where this, what the map is, re uh, representing, then you have kind of a bar or fixed point because you're kind of standing at the fixed point itself. The map is lying in the bigger map, which is now the real world, but it's kind of a bigger version of, of the small map. And there was a, a map in the mathematical sense from the big one to the small one. And this map has a fixed point, and that's the point where you stand. Very so, and this works for any continuous map, very surprising statement, for any crumbling of your paper. On the other hand, Jordan, a very innocent statement. It sounds extremely innocent. The proof isn't all that innocent. The proof is actually pretty complicated, but it sounds very innocent. It's just a statement that whenever you have a, a reasonable line, it is closed. Let's say, in, let's say we do this in, uh, in R2, some reasonable closed line going all the way around, so continuous. Then you can separate R2 in an outside and an inside. So in my picture here, blue and, and red. Sounds pretty simple. Right? That, that's obvious, right? That, that this is true is obvious. It turns out that the obvious one, with a complicated proof, is equivalent to the non-obvious one with a reasonable proof. So Brouwer is actually in some sense easier to prove, or at least easier to think about. If you know a little bit of algebraic topology, it just it just follows immediately, basically. Jordan is much trickier. One of them is obviously true. The other one is very surprising. But reverse mathematics in this axiom system now tells you that they're actually equivalent or equal in the correct way, um, which I think is very surprising. Anyway, um, so I, in the end, I actually showed you two of my favorite theorems, uh, Brouwer's fixed point theorem and the Jordan uh, curve theorem. But strictly speaking, this video wasn't really about a theorem itself, um, but more like about a general philosophy in mathematics to do it in the opposite way. You don't prove theorems, but you take your favorite theorem you break it into its basic pieces and then you compare it to other of your favorite theorems, which certainly is a really, really good topic for a series, which is called What Are My Favorite Theorems, I guess. Anyway, I'm already starting waffling, so I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.